Hello friends, I am Dr. Jayadeep Shodangi. I am faculty Jogesh Chandra Choudhury College, University of Calcutta, Kolkata. Friends, we are into module 13. Module 13 is contribution of Geoffrey Chaucer. This module is prepared by Dr. Mohua Bhomik, who teaches English at Derosio College, Kolkata. Friends, in this module, we are going to look into the contribution of Geoffrey Chaucer. We shall divide his literary career into three phases. And what are the productions and what are the works that he has come out in these three phases? We shall also evaluate him in the context of his time. He was a man of the age. And in other ways, we can tell it, we can tell that the age has been named after him. We call the age the age of Chaucer. So, the man is so important in his age. So, friends, we start with a little bit of introduction to this great man. The most important writer of Middle English period, without whom any discussion of Middle English poetry is complete is Geoffrey Chaucer. He is undoubtedly the poet of the Middle English period in whose capable and confident hands both English language and literature attained maturity and excellence. His range, complexity, humorous tone, essentially human outlook and technical brilliance place him much above the other poets of his own generation. His acquaintance with European literature enabled him to deal in English with themes and attitudes per prevalent in European literature. So, he was a keen observer of human nature and portrayed it with a balance between sympathy and irony. His training in courtly and diplomatic lifestyle helped him to pre present diverse characters in his works. With utmost conviction, his employment in diverse forms of public and civil services and his journeys abroad on the business of the ki king gave him opportunity to come across different kinds of people people ranging from aristocracy to the lowest segments of the society. So, the man has great knowledge of life. He has seen life closely and he has experienced it thoroughly. His journey to France and Italy were particularly significant because these helped him to be acquainted with Italian literature, especially the works of Dante and Boccaccio. During his second voyage to Italy, he met Barbo Vascanti and the Lord of Milan, whose death is the subject matter of one stanza in the work called Monk's Tell. Friends, this was the man Geoffrey Chaucer. Now, if we literally map his entire career, we can divide his career into three different periods. Period 1, that is French period, period 2, that is Italian period, and period 3, that is English period. Friends, two most brilliant works under French period are one, Romant of the Rose, the Book of the Dutch Sea. Now, we should have a general discussion of his contribution in this French period. The fascination of Chaucer for everything French can be understood because of his long association with people belonging to the royalty, court and government spheres. The people for whom French was the chosen aristocratic language. Chaucer was deeply inspired by the rose tradition and the later French developments on it. 
His early works bear testimony to his fascination with French poets like Deschamps and Froissart. This phase of Chaucer's writing is termed as the French period. The poems belonging to the French group include The Remount of the Rose, which is a lengthy allegorical poem of which only a fragment is available. It is inspired by the French original Le Remount de la Rose. And sorry for my French pronunciation. Chaucer translated only a part of its, that is, fragment A. The poem is in the form of a dream. It is a vision of a dreamer who strolls by the side of a river one fine May morning and enjoys the sweet melodies and songs of the birds, the blossoming of flowers, the cozy warmth of the pleasant weather. It is a season of love with and when both the humans and animals choose their the dreamer arrive. Arrives at a garden, garden surrounded by a wall, which is painted on the outside with different allegorical and disagreeable characters like covent covetousness, ill breeding and old age. A young girl called Idleness opens the gate and allows the dreamer in. Inside the garden he observes much more delightful objects as the beautiful flowers, tall trees, creeping birds, small animals, a melodious tune and the dancing laid by the allegorical figures. Mirth and his retinue. The dreamer sees the reflections of the delightful garden particularly a rose, bush surrounded by a hedge, but ex exuding the intoxicating fragrance. The dreamer's eyes are fixed on one particular bud, which is beautiful. Fragment A comes to an end here. The other parts of the French poem are translated by Gloomy D. Loris and Jane D. Mon. The other important books Belonging to this group of, of poems is the book of the Dutch Sea, and the, which draws heavily, heavily on Macure, Ovid, Froschant, and remains a dream in form. But it is marked by Chaucer's own treatment of it. The poem is probably Chaucer's earliest composition, and it dates back to 1369 AD. It is written in a dream allegory tradition on the death of Blanquet, the Duchess of Lancaster. It is an elegy on the demise of Blanchet, who was the first wife of Chaucer's lifelong friend and patron John of Gaunt and mother of Havoff Lanc Lancaster, the future Henry IV. Blanchet has been depicted as beautiful and accomplished and Chaucer emphasizes on her sociability and gaiety. The poem begins with the poet reading the tragic story of Queen Alcane, who fervently plays to judo for the news of his shipwreck six in Ovid's Metamorphosis. Let us quote a few lines from here. And called he right as she had by name, and sinned my sweet wife Vivi. Let be your sorrowful life, for your sore there lieth no red, for scent is sweet, I nam I but died, ye shun me, never on liar's side. I kept intact the original format of the language. Now, after the French period, friends, let us have a look of the Italian period by Chaucer. Four major creations are marked by this period. Number one, the Parliament of Fowls, the House of Fame, Trialus and Crusade, the Legend of Good Women. The Italian stage is marked by significant advances upon the French stage in Chaucer's increasing sense of perception, great technical expertise and originality. 
any leader and are side and the parliament of fowls belong to this group of poems. The former is an incomplete work and it seems, it seems as if after around 3000 lines the poet abandoned the project altogether. However, the complaint of an leader with his perfect balance of strophe and antistrophe can be considered to be one of the finest examples of Middle English literature. It is pity that the fragrant, in a fragrant form, it remains. The Parliament of Fowls uses the convention of a dream allegory and the demand de armor and is marked by a celebration of St. Valentine's Day. The poem is divided into three parts. The poem, the poet is acquainted with the love not in Didi, but in the books only. The poet is busy reading Simeon Scripians in Caesarius De Replica, Republica, Book 4, for the whole day and falls asleep because of exhaustion. Quite naturally, he dreams of Sifo, who desires to reward the dreamer and takes him to part of surrounded by worlds. The poet is confused and uh, he is confused to observe inscriptions over two sides of the gate. However, he understands that these inscriptions are not meant for him, but the lover's servants. The second part of the book describes the garden and remains and reminds us of the setting of the Roman de la Rose, the mesmerizing beauty of the garden with trees, flowers, birds, small rivers, Cupid and his assistance has unmistakable echoes of paradise. Let's have the feel of this period. Up there on the screen, you have few lines. Starting with, there's that place so a temper was that never was the grevener of hot he knee cold. Friends, while wandering through the garden, the dreamer sees a temple of Venice and the section is inspired by Boccaccio's Tassuda. After being fascinated by the book of Venice, he comes to the goddess nature, who is presiding over the birds and their debate. This part of the poem is based on a popular belief that the birds choose their partners on St. Valentine's Day. Thus, Chaucer, Chaucer presents a group of birds with a female eagle being the center of attraction because of her goodness and beauty. She has three suitors eagerly waiting for response to their plea. Though nature suggests her to select the royal suitor, she asks for one year span to, in order to make her choice. The poem is a marvelous example of Chaucer's comic spirit revealed through the art of characterization of the birds and the stiff competition among the sweeters for the hand of the formal and through the byplay by over the diverse opinions and impatience of the inferior birds regarding this situation. So, you can easily understand how Chaucer was a master, master of painting all these things. There are speculations that the poem is, this, is a celebration of the engagement of Richard II with Anne of Bohemia. The other suitors are thought to be Charles IV of France and Frederick of Michelin. These are other interpretations as well. The other three parts of the poem are connected through the character of Sinem, who acts as the guide of the dreamer. However, these three parts are marked by different styles of writings. The first part is philosophical, the second one is slow movement and the debate is an instance of a variety of language depending on the status of the birds and the parliament of fowls is considered to be one of the Chaucer's small yet perfectly finished work. Around this time Chaucer translated Boethus's Consolation of Philosophy. This is an important work, Consolation of Philosophy by Boethius, 
and in the early 80s and the influence of this work is palpable in the poems like Palamon and Arcti included as Knight's tell in the in the Canterbury tells Troilus and Chryside which were composed between 1382 and 1386. This speaks of Chaucer's wide range of interest through his prose tales are often without proper form as we find in Canterbury Tales. Friends, after the Italian period comes Chaucer's last period, that is English period. This period is marked by Chaucer's outstanding work and the most commendable work called the Canterbury Tales. Our whole module, next module is devoted to the, uh, to the Canterbury Tales, but in this module we will talk a little bit about the English period of Geoffrey Chaucer. The English stage of Chaucer is considered as the stage of his great achievement when he is composed is one of the landmarks of English literature, the Canterbury Tales. Chaucer was deeply influenced by Boccaccio for the general idea of this poem, but the influence was interpreted by his English sensibility. It deals with the 29 pilgrims who are going to pay a visit to the tomb of Thomas a Becket at Canterbury and during the course of this journey meet at the Tabard Inn in the South Work, where they are telling tales from diverse literary and folk sources to while away their time. Chaucer with his keen power of observation and having great knowledge about human character chooses the pilgrims from all ranks of the society from the chivalrous knight to the humble plowman. This gives Chaucer the opportunity to blend the, his literary knowledge with his observant nature. The general prologue succeeds to set the scene and establish the characters. It is an unfinished work and is marked by a fresh approach to literature, brilliant use of irony, humor and spontaneity. This magnum opus of Chaucer will be dealt with in great detail in our next module. Do not forget to remem uh, remember the most important thing in English period, the outstanding work the Canterbury tells. So friends, we should note the excellence of Chaucer, one of the greatest poets of middle English period in whose capability and confidence gives English language and literature maturity. Range, complexity, humorous tone, essentially human outlook, technical brilliance place him above many other poets of his age. Acquaintance with European literature enabled him to deal in English with themes and attitudes prevalent in European literature. He is a keen observer of human nature, balance between sympathy and irony. So friends, if we are to conclude, we must assess that the contribution of Chaucer was enormous in the context of his age. His, his uh, works become magnum opus of the ages to come. Geoffrey Chaucer was not only a contributor of poetry, his contribution in the context of language, English language was specific and his excellent use of imagery, word painting all contributed a lot to the general growth and development of English literature and language during his own time. So, on the whole, the contribution of Geoffrey Chaucer, his three broad periods and if we can mark his entire career into three periods, they are all effective and with these three periods, Chaucer's contribution is more than larger than life. Here are a few audio visual links on the screen. The outstanding English poet, Geoffrey Chaucer, renowned before Shakespeare, is considered the first finder of our English language. His Canterbury Tales ranks as one of the greatest public works in English literature. 
renowned author, Chaucer also contributed importantly to the second half of the 14th century to the management of public affairs as a courtier, diplomat, and civil servant. In a career that spanned three successive kings, Chaucer was praised and trusted, but it is his avocation, the writing of poetry, for which he is remembered. Geoffrey Chaucer was born around 1342, likely in London. His family name derives from the French Chaucer, meaning shoemaker, though Chaucer's father was a wine merchant. Chaucer's first appearance in historic records is in 1357 as a member of the household of Elizabeth, Countess of Ulster, wife of Lionel, third son of King Edward III. Geoffrey's father presumably had been able to place him among a group of young men and women serving in that royal household, a customary arrangement whereby families who could provide their children with opportunity necessary for courtly education and connections to advance their careers, especially since Chaucer reportedly had 16 siblings. This was going to excel him in society. Though this meant Chaucer had to leave his family and work as a page in servant to a knight, he was only 15 years old. By age 17, Chaucer was a member of King Edward III's army in France and was even captured during the, the unsuccessful siege of Reims. The king himself contributed to Chaucer's ransom to save him in order to return him to his majesty's service. Chaucer surfaced again in historic record on February 22, 1366, when the King of Navarre issued a certificate of safe conduct for Chaucer, three companions, and their servants to enter the country of Spain. This occasion is the first of a number of diplomatic missions to the continent of Europe over the succeeding ten years. At the age of 25, Chaucer had moved from a household servant, a soldier, to that of a trusted diplomat. So much responsibility and activity in public matters appears to have left Chaucer little time for writing. However, the time traveling did expose Chaucer to the works of Dante, Petrarch, and Bocchiasso, which was later to have a profound influence upon his own writing. No information exists concerning Chaucer's early education although doubtlessly he would have been fluent in French, as was the Middle English of the time. He also became competent in Latin and Italian. His writings show that he's closely familiar with many important books of his time. In 1366, Chaucer had married longtime friend Philippa Pan, a lady-in-waiting to the Queen of England, and continued his work for His Majesty as a diplomat. With Chaucer's career prospering and his first important poem, Book of the Duchess, becoming popular, Chaucer continued to connect himself with persons in high places. This first poem was more than 1,300 lines long, probably written in late 1369 or early 1370. It is written for the funeral of Blanche, Duchess of Lancaster, wife of John the Gaunt who died of plague in September 1369. John of Gaunt was Chaucer's best friend. Lord, but mine heart is maketh light, when I think on that sweetest right, a commonly one to see, and wish to God it might so he, that she would hold me for her knight, my lady, fair and bright. When Rich II ascended the throne, Chaucer was appointed clerk of the king's work, his pay raise was more than 30 pounds a year and a pitcher of wine daily. He became responsible for construction at Westminster, the Tower of London, and several castles and manors, but times were still hard for Chaucer. It is during the same time that Chaucer was caught up in illegal scandal. The charges were dropped and Chaucer was found not guilty, but regardless, Chaucer's place in society greatly changed. He resigned, or was removed, it is not clear, but Chaucer left the court and moved to Kent, after which his wife, Philippa, died due to poor health, leaving Chaucer with two sons and two daughters. Between the years of 1387 and 1400, Chaucer devoted much of his time writing his most famous work, Canterbury Tales. 
The humor of the work is sometimes very subtle, but is often broad and outspoken when compared to other works written at the same time. Chaucer's original plan for the Canterbury Tales called for two tales each from over 20 pilgrims making a journey from Southwark, England, to the shrine of St. Thomas Becket of Canterbury, England. He later modified the plan to write only one tale for each pilgrim on the road to Canterbury, but he only finished 24 tales out of the 120 stories is believed he had been planning. Chaucer introduces each of these pilgrims as vivid, brief sketches, a lively mix of a variety of genres told by the ta travelers of all aspects of society. The tale survives in groups connected by prologues, or introductions, and epilogues, conclusions, but the proper arrangement of these groups is not altogether clear. At this time in medieval England, Literature was separated into very distinct styles, focused more on audience, the lower, middle, and upper classes, than its characters. Chaucer, however, moves freely between all of these styles, showing favoritism to none. He not only considers the reader of his work as his intended audience, but the other pilgrims within the story as well, creating a multi-layer rhetorical puzzle of ambiguities. Chaucer's work thus far surpasses the ability of any single medieval theory to uncover. Chaucer avoids targeting any specific audience or social class of reader, focusing instead on the characters of the story. The characters are written with a skill proportional to their social status and learning. Chaucer draws on his own unique background, knowledge, literary influences, and life experiences. The characters are all divided into three distinct classes. The classes begin with those who pray, the clergy, the highest of all of the classes in medieval England. Those who fight, the nobility, and those who work, the commoners and the peasantry. Chaucer also breathes new life into his female characters, giving them, for a first time, a voice as narrator. Until now, medieval literature only classified women as wives, virgins, or prostitutes. They were never given a primary role in a story. When Henry IV takes the throne, Chaucer hoped to find a new job under a new king. And while Chaucer's reputation for loyalty earned him a small pension, Chaucer went months without pay and was near penniless. Nevertheless, on the strength of his expectations, on the 4th of December, 1399, he released a tenement in the garden of St. Mary's Chapel at Westminster, and it was probably here that he died on the 25th of the following October. He was buried in Westminster Abbey, and his tomb became a nucleus of what is now known as Poet's Corner. It is unclear how he died, and some have even speculated that he may have been murdered. Little is known about this great man's end. Even with such unique and varied life, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales praises the poet as the greatest English poet of all time, and the first to truly show what the language was capable of becoming. His work has influenced all to come after him. The work of Shakespeare, Marlowe, Edgar Allan Poe, Charles Dickens, and even author J.K. Rowling credits Chaucer as a strong influence. A very modest plaque was placed at Geoffrey Chaucer's tomb when he died. However, 150 years later, in 1556, as a testament to his great poetic works. Poet Nicholas Burnham constructed a more magnificent tomb in honor of the father and finder of our English language. Today, Chaucer's tomb still stands and hundreds of visitors pay him homage each day. His works and his unconventional creativity in the 14th century credit him with not only founding the English language, but for capturing the voice of kings and commoners alike.